Guys, we're in the middle of a pandemic and these are trying times. It's hard on our mental health, our mental state. And this is why I love our sponsor today, BetterHelp. They're the largest online counseling platform worldwide. They change the way people get help with facing life's challenges by providing convenient, discreet, affordable access to licensed therapists. BetterHelp makes professional counseling available anytime, anywhere, through a computer, tablet, or smartphone. It's brilliant. Sign up today. Go to betterhelp.com backslash solving healthcare and get 10% off sign up fees. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quadro Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. Qualcast Nation, we got you a mini cast. My boy here, Dr. Shannon Fernando, recently graduated from his intensive care and emergency medicine training, helped orchestrate this beautiful study looking at ICU patients and their risk of suicide. And we know through previous studies that you get through your, your ICU run, you know, you have the physical constraints, difficulty breathing maybe, but also PTSD anxiety, depression, all major concerns after you leave the ICU. And we're in the midst of this third wave and having a lot of patients receiving aggressive measures. And, you know, this study that we were able to uh, publish in the British Medical Journal showed that you're, you know, being an ICU patient does put you at higher risk compared to patients that are not in the ICU of, a, of not only a self-harm, but suicide. So we, we, we're addressing, we're, we're talking about this paper today. But before we jump on it, I want to tell you once again about Solving Wellness. This is a program we're doing to reach out to healthcare providers to really address burnout. We, we're doing online workouts, yoga, mindful meditation, cooking classes, nutrition tips, all things to try and improve the overall well-being of healthcare providers. Because if we want to improve the care of our patients, we need to be sound in mind. We need to be ready to go. So go to solvingwellness.ca to find out more information. You sign up now, you get your first month for free. You know what I'm saying? Because what we're trying to do is change that boogie. All right. So let's just jump into it. Mini cast. Without further ado, our boy, Resource Optimization Network member, Dr. Shannon Fernando. Quarkast Nation, we got a recurrent guest, former trainee, now full-fledged physician. I think last time you were on the show, you were still in, in the midst of your, your training, but now you're you're a big boy now. We got Dr. Shannon Fernando. Welcome to the Quadcast. Thanks, man. Uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, last time I was here was uh, December 2019 in, in the old world before. <laughs> I can't remember. Like, it's, we look back at it with such fondness, right? Like, uh, we were in the same room doing this, buddy. Yeah, I know. I remember we were in the same room, no masks. I yeah. mean, it's like a different, different world now. But thanks for having me back, man. It's always a, a huge honor. Absolutely. I, I, I want to just, um, before jumping into it, also just bring some attention to the fact that I don't know if there's been any trainee that has pumped out as many papers as uh, Shannon here. And, you know, he came up with this, I, this project idea in terms of looking at, you know, when we have our ICU patients go through what they go through, are they at higher risk of suicide or self-harm? And when, when we brought up the idea, I was like, yeah, buddy, this is, this is so not only timely, but like we can make this happen. But maybe Shannon, tell me what, what brought this on? What got you excited about the project? Yeah. So I think, you know, in the, in the intensive care unit, you're, I mean, you're an intensive care physician. So my, I think we pride ourselves on uh, saving lives, right? That's what we do is uh, it's what we've always been focused on. And over time, way more people are surviving in the ICU. Like there are people who survive, uh, you know, pretty lengthy bouts of, of life support that, you know, 40, 50 years ago would never have survived. And, and uh, we're becoming more selective. We have a better idea of who's going to survive. But I think that focus on making sure the patient survives and, and this, this really, really severe illness uh, is what we pride ourselves on, right? Um, but what's become really clear uh, in the last, you know, 10, 15 years is that patients who survive the intensive care unit, uh, they don't go back uh, to living their lives the way they were before they got sick. Uh, that's like really, really landmark work uh, done by a few 
people who are co-authors on our paper, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Margaret Herridge from Toronto, Dr. Dale Needham uh, from Johns Hopkins, where they show that patients who survive or ICU survivors have pretty significant symptoms. They have weakness, they have reduced exercise tolerance, they have fatigue. Um, a lot of them have financial difficulty. They can never get back to work. These aren't things we think about uh, when we save uh, somebody's life. It's, that was always the focus, but uh, I think it made us stop and think twice. And then there was recent work uh, done by another one of our co-authors, uh, Dr. Hannah Wunsch, which showed that uh, these patients have significant psychiatric morbidity. And uh, I think appropriately, uh, mental health is starting to gain more and more, uh, more and more focus uh, from research and research funding. And we're starting to realize that uh, people from all, all walks of life uh, are affected by mental suffering and mental illness uh, is really ubiquitous. And of course, the, the reason that it's become so focused is not only the, the suffering involved from mental illness, but also the fact that we believe that mental illness can lead to death by suicide. Mm -hmm. And so death by suicide, I think, is really, really, I think most of us would characterize it as a public health problem. Um, it, is a, it affects all walks of life, like I mentioned. Um, and I think most of us see it as something that's potentially preventable. I think whoever you are uh, and whatever you do, you can probably think of somebody you know or have seen that, whose life has ended by suicide and, and you probably didn't understand why. Um, and so more, the more understanding we can gain into why uh, people commit or complete suicide, the better. And, and because we know that these ICU patients uh, are at higher risk of mental illness, uh, it, it made sense then to take the next step and see, well, are they at higher risk of suicide? So it was a really important question, never been looked at before. And uh, I'm proud to say that uh, we now have some data uh, that gives us an idea uh, of that question. Yeah, no, a really important uh, question. And I'll, I'll just kind of reiterate to what Shannon's mentioned and like, you know, yes, there's a physical constraints that we see, but the psychiatric ailments post ICU, that PTSD, that anxiety, depression, well documented in the literature. But yeah, we, we, we really didn't know are people harming themselves after leaving us. And, and obviously, we, if we could do something to intervene or, or, or assess that or assess risk, this is such an important question. And so, Shannon, maybe walk us through like the results. So, uh, of, of what we found. Yeah, so I, I think we asked two really uh, important questions in this study. The first question, a very basic question, is are ICU survivors at higher risk of suicide uh, as compared to patients who survive hospitalization who don't need the ICU? So we looked at this question using um, uh, the great support from uh, the ICES uh, and data from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. So this is provincial data from Ontario. Basically, if you're living in Ontario, your data is in this database. Um, across nine years and 420,000 uh, ICU survivors, so a gigantic uh, data set. Uh, and what we looked at first was, uh, you know, what's the incidence of suicide compared to patients who, uh, over 3 million patients uh, who were admitted to hospital but never needed the ICU. And we looked at that and we saw, well, the incidence uh, of suicide was higher. Now, I think most of us understand that somebody who goes to the ICU and uh, ends up uh, on a, a mechanical ventilator uh, and has all this organ support is different from a patient who breaks their ankle and comes to the hospital for a few days. Um, and so we use really complex uh, statistical methods I won't get into to try and match these groups a little bit closer. And even when we did that, we saw that the incidence or the, the risk of suicide was higher in the ICU survivors. So it really uh, showed us that even when we adjust for the data as much as we possibly can, um, there really is a real signal here that shows us that ICU survivors at high risk of uh, death by suicide uh, and self-harm behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, so that includes poisonings and, and, uh, and uh, self-inflicted trauma. So that was really uh, important, never been demonstrated before. And then now that we had the answer to that first question, we looked at the second question. The second question being, now that we know that these patients are at higher risk, can we identify uh, what factors are associated uh, among these 420,000 ICU survivors? What factors to help predict or prognosticate who would go on to complete suicide? And I would say that's probably the most interesting finding of this study. Um, we identified three really, really key uh, prognostic factors associated with death by suicide. The first was younger age. So the younger the patient was, the higher the risk of suicide. And, and we know from existing suicide data uh, that extremes of age, the very young and the very old, are at the highest risk of suicide. So it was kind of in keeping. The second major prognostic factor was a pre-existing history uh, of uh, mental health diagnoses. So these are patients with pre-existing de depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, and, and psychosis. Um, these were huge predictors uh, of mm. suicide uh, among ICU survivors. Um, and then the third thing, um, which was also really interesting, was patients who received interventions that we consider to be the most extreme forms of life support. So invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, being on a breathing machine, uh, which is obviously very much topical these days in the midst of the pandemic, uh, 
uh, and renal replacement therapy or dialysis. So what we did was we then saw that those, those risk factors were additive. We made these nice heat maps that you can see in the paper that show that if you have all three of those factors, you're a young person, you have pre-existing mental health diagnoses, and you receive these really intense interventions, you're the patient who's at highest risk. And why I thought that was interesting is it's really different from the, the research that has come before that has looked at ICU survivors, which has shown that it's the patient who, uh, who you know, has increased disability, who goes to a long-term care facility, uh, who has increased fatigue. That's the population we've really focused on, like you were talking about with the, the physical constraints and the physical uh, issues that arise after ICU admission. That's the population we focused on. This is a completely new and different population that, to be honest, um, the young person who goes home uh, independent, that's the patient we used to high five each other about that we used to think those were the really big wins. Um, and they probably still are the biggest wins, but it, this is a really uh, important finding and a really important uh, risk factor that seems to, to, to come out from these patients. And, and then the next question is, well, well why? Um, why are high C survivors at higher risk? And while we didn't look at it in the paper, I think we could think of all kinds of reasons based on the factors we found. Perhaps uh, ICU admission, uh, you know, is it's itself extremely traumatic and, and can lead to those feelings. Perhaps it brings out previous feelings of trauma that people have experienced in their lives. Perhaps by being in the ICU and the prolonged hospital stay that comes with it, when you leave the hospital, you're not connected anymore with mm-hmm. uh, your healthcare providers. Uh, there's all of those things that I think we need to look at as to the question of why, why, why is this happening? But exactly to your point with ICU admissions on the rise uh, across this province, um, we really, really need to pay more attention to uh, how these patients are going to do once they leave. Um, and uh, I hope that this paper sheds a bit more light on that. Yeah. And as you said, Shannon, when we think about what's going on in our province right now, so we're just time stamping this. We're doing this interview April 27th. And, you know, we're seeing unprecedented numbers of COVID patients in our ICU. I, number of ICU patients in general has been unprecedented. And unfortunately, we're seeing younger patients that are re- receiving what we're talking about, more aggressive measures, mechanical ventilation or breathing machines. To, some of them are needing dialysis, some of the measures we're talking about. And so, you know, these are people that will be at risk based on the, our study results, you know, like, and, and not only is it important to identify but I think it's fair to say, uh, Shannon, like, you know, the next steps is at some point to be able to intervene with some of this, uh, with some of this information. So like, what, what, what do you see, like, what, what do you see would be like kind of future directions that you, you would love to see if, uh, if you had a crystal ball or if you had a unlimited funds in terms of uh, next steps? I think that's the, the big question is how does this help us now? How do we apply this? Um, I think the first thing is seeing whether the, the, uh, the, in, the interventions we already have in place or we think we have in place to mitigate these, uh, these harms are, are helpful. So if a patient leaves hospital, leaves ICU, um, and they get followed up uh, by their family physician or a psychiatrist, is that beneficial? I don't know. I mean, it's one of the things we're interested in looking at next um, and I think would be really valuable to know. Uh, if it is, then that's great. That's an answer of some kind that, that shows us that perhaps we need to just connect more of these patients. Uh, but if it isn't, then it gets to your point of, of you know, driving new novel interventions that might be helpful. Um, I think for us, if you were to ask me as a clinician, um, how do you apply this? Uh, I think that that's really important. Uh, what I would say is, first of all, I, I've, I've ident- we've identified a, a population of patients that we never really considered before mm-hmm. um, and a risk factor we've never really considered before. So it is something that is actually on my mind now uh, when I see these patients, uh, specifically the patients we identify as high risk. It also helps me pay more attention to pre-existing psych psychiatric morbidity. I think by our nature as ICU physicians, we focus on the patient who has existing heart failure, existing lung disease, kidney disease. We kind of gloss over the depression, the anxiety, or, mm-hmm. and, and we don't think so much about it. We, honestly, we don't even look to start most of those medications uh, while they're in the ICU. Um, and I'm not saying that we need to do that, but at least it, it heightens our awareness that, wow, that's an important comorbidity that has effects. I think if you're a physician and you want to apply this study uh, at, uh, at the bedside uh, in the ICU, then that's an easy way to do it is to at least screen for this. And I think that's the next major uh, intervention is if we screen for this and we identify this, uh, how do we, perhaps we can identify, we can find the patients who are at highest risk because I think just making sure every single patient who's the ICU to follow up is not realistic or Mm -hmm. uh, within our existing healthcare system. I'd like to think that all the research that we've done um, through the resource optimization network and this podcast, I think it's all been geared to just being more efficient with the health, with, with healthcare. 
Um, and our, that's the goal of our research is not necessarily that everybody needs this intervention. It's to say, hey, let's figure out who the people are that need this the most um, and then use these resources in the smartest way. And I think screening patients, to identify who are at the highest risk, and, and then looking at uh, if we get these patients follow-up or immediate follow-up, um, or if we connect them with uh, even psychologists, uh, help networks, things like that, anything that gives them some kind of support network that might mitigate this risk, uh, I think that's, those are the really big next steps. But first things first, let's see if the existing infrastructure we have in place is protective. And I don't know uh, that it is. I think that's a really interesting question uh, to answer yeah. next. Yeah, next step's good. But certainly, I want to reinforce like that this is something that we potentially can intervene on. That we, you know, at, whether that is that psychologist, whether it is that uh, counselor, whether it is that, you know, group therapy, whatever it might be, this is a, that, that has that potential. And so I, I got to say, buddy, this, this project, I'm mad proud that you threw down, like I knew it was going to be something, but man, I just, I didn't say it yet, but B M J son, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We ain't, it ain't playing. That's a, that's the real deal, but uh, we're real proud of you and that you're a real uh, contributor to the advancement within our uh, critical care community and you're making a difference, buddy. So yeah, thank you for doing thanks. this. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for having me. And thank, uh, thanks to our research team uh, for all their time and investment, especially you uh, for investing your time and your money, uh, your hard-earned grant money in, this, <laughs> in these projects. Uh, it, it means a lot, man. And I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, as you say, we'll keep changing the boogie. All yeah, right, change that boogie. All right, guys, peace. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Quadcast Nation, I hope you enjoyed that mini cast. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook at Quadcast. Please leave that five-star rating. Helps with the visibility of the show. And you know, with us, this is how we change that boogie. Leave any comments at quadcast99 at gmail.com. Solving Wellness, don't forget about that. Go to solvingwellness.ca. If you're a healthcare provider looking to improve overall well-being, for reals. Anyways, thank you so much, guys. We'll connect again real soon. Stay safe. Peace.